Welcome to Hockey Night in New York, where Islanders hockey always reigns supreme. Whether you were raised at the barn in Uniondale or born in the stable at Belmont, Hockey Night in New York is your home for all things Isles. Now, let's drop the puck and get this party started. Ladies and gentlemen, it is Hockey Night in New York. Welcome to the program, everyone. It is Sunday, April 14th, 2024. Coming at you live from Blue Line Deli and Bagels right here in Huntington. Big day here today. Help Donnie Rosner raise some money for a great cause. The Chloe Bell Foundation had a great time doing that earlier with Donnie. He did a fantastic job. Raised $4,000 for the Chloe Bell Foundation. Did an excellent, excellent job. And we're here now to talk some New York Islanders at Hockey Night in New York. Big show coming up for you. Ken Danico, New Jersey Devils legend, coming on to talk about the Islanders Devils tilt coming up tomorrow. And of course, the Big Eastern Conference playoff race. Can't can't wait to talk to Ken. With me as always is Mr. Stefan Rosner. And we got Edzo and we got Jake the Snake over here in the Snake Den. Join us for a big show. Stefan, how you doing, pal? Doing great. Just came uh, from North Hall practice rink. The Islanders practice today, which not wasn't a shock after they played, but now Huge game coming up against the Devils. Huge. Winning in. Yep. That's it. Get two points. And not only are you in, but you get the third place in the Metro, and then you wait to find out if you're facing the Rangers or the Carolina Hurricanes. Yeah, obviously the Islanders and Rangers in the playoffs hasn't happened since last time the Rangers won a cup. Islanders played the Hurricanes last year, so it'll be interesting either way, but I think Islander fans and Ranger fans are, are both praying that it's uh, Islander-Ranger first-round matchup. That would be nice. That's what I'm pulling for, but before we dive into all that, I'm going to tell you all about our wonderful, wonderful sponsor, starting with right here at Blue Line, Deli and Bagel. Satisfy your hunger at 719 West Jericho Turnpike in Huntington and 217 Carlton Avenue in East Islip. Check out the menu at BlueLineDeli.com. Also proud to be sponsored by Main Street Board Game Cafe. Find your crowd and unplug your game at 307 Main Street in in Huntington Village, and also proud to be sponsored by Razor and Kniff Attorneys at Law, ready to fight for you. Check them out at RazorandKniff.com, that's R-A-I-S-E-R-K-E-N-N-I-F-F.com for a free consultation, and now with the pleasantries out of the way. Stefan, let's talk a little Islanders here. We, we had an injury scare with Noah Dobson, maybe if you have an update on that, what do you got? Yeah, so he left the game early against Montreal, doesn't play against the Rangers, he's day-to-day -day with an upper body injury. That's all we're getting as of right now. He's not okay. doesn't look like he's going to play against the Devils. Wasn't at practice today. Riley filled in on the power play in the top unit. They moved out to the second with Pulak. So yeah, right now they're without Dobson, which is a vital loss. But every team's go through injuries at certain point of the years, and it's up to the Islanders now to find a way. I think the good news is that it's just day to day. We just got to find out how many days that's going to be. <laughs> But I think there was a little bit of a scare that it could have been a little longer term. So hopefully he's back. Obviously, we know how vital he is to the team, what a season that he's had. And hopefully he's there, he's back soon to help them either get into the playoffs or when the playoffs start. Yeah, I mean, we saw last year when the Islanders lost Roman at the end of the regular season. You right. just have to find a way. Maybe it, obviously mm -hmm. they got Roman back for the playoffs. He wasn't at his best. But yeah, this is about to show really what this team's made of. Losing your most prolific offensive defenseman, your guy that's quarterbacking and struggling power play unit. But we saw against the Rangers that even with that power play struggling, losing Dobson, it looks a lot worse. It was a lot harder for them to settle in. So we'll see what happens. Iowa's going to play. is going to play. And this is why you added depth. You look at the moves Lou made. And sure, it wasn't to replace Dobson, but you had Pellet go down, Ajo go down, Mayfield go down. Pulak go down. So it's Dobson's turn to go <laughs> yes. down now. And, and this, Bit is of a sign, carousel. this is the sign of a good team, what you're made of, when you could see guys step up in key roles. And no one's going to replace what Dobson's, Dobson brings, but collectively we'll see if they could bounce back and find a way there. Yeah, it tests the depth of your team. And we've seen the Islanders go through this, especially a lot with the defense this year, as you just pointed out. And you had guys like Bortuzzo and, and Riley coming in. Riley, who's looking really good, actually. I think I love, I love what he's done this season. But, you know, we'll see what happens with Dobson. Was there any other news on the lineup front? So Varlamov will be in goal against okay. the Devils. Yes, Sorokin okay. goes in. Probably is one of his better performances of the year. Definitely as of late, 41 saves. Shootouts are a different story with Sorokin. I think he's got a 600-something six, <laughs> yeah. save, but it's, it's shootouts. Other thing to keep an eye on is Kyle McLean left practice early due to sickness. Okay. Well, I was expecting him to play, but we've all been sick before, stomach flu. Sure. We'll see what happens. I think the Islanders will skate tomorrow morning. If not, we'll talk to Wah before the game starts. That's the other thing, but besides that, status quo. Status quo, so why don't we dive into the game recaps here. We'll talk about what happened this week. Obviously, the Islanders are riding a seven-game point streak now. They went on the six-game winning streak. They get the overtime loss against the Rangers, but let's dive in to all of that. So let's rewind to Tuesday. The 4-2 win against the Rangers, 3-0 first period. Uh, Varlamov outstanding in that game. You get the rare empty net goal from Anders Lee. Everybody's feeling pretty good. 
Uh, obviously, the Rangers come back on two power play goals. Still kind of a, a narrative here for the New York Rangers as they struggle to score five on five. They get the two power play goals to make it interesting, but the Islanders hang on. They get the, get the empty netter and a big two points against the Rangers. Yeah, I don't think any Islander fan watched that game and was satisfied with how it ends. Sure. Obviously, there's some other things that happen at the end of this game here that we could dive into for a sec, but... The positive is that the Islanders got on a very good team early. A, a team that, sure, maybe their 5-5 five five numbers are in the middle of the pack. They know how to transition the puck. We saw it at MSG in that embarrassing loss. We saw it at the outdoor game when they finally turned it on. But right. that was the thing. They get up to the early lead and you're thinking, just don't do what you did at the outdoor game and you'll be fine. Stay <laughs> right. out of the box. And what right. happens is, mm-hmm. even if they score on the power play or not, you're just giving momentum to a team that didn't have any. They came out pretty flat and you allow them to get back in it. And I didn't think they sat back. In the third, it was just a situation of once the Rangers got to their game, there was not much the Islanders could do. Now, of course, they had chances to clear and didn't, and that's been a common theme the entire year. Yes. But like you said, Varlamov, I mean, brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. We have the Pelik running into Zib- uh, excuse me, Zibanejad running into Pelik, leading to some post-game comments. Lavalette <laughs> ended up walking him back, saying that he was more pissed that they didn't get power play chances, but you just said it. Why is he pissed they didn't get more power play chances? Because they're struggling at 5-on-5, five five and they need power plays right. to win. So we'll see what happens with the Rangers in the playoffs, because mo- you're likely going to play more 5-on-5 five five than you are special teams. But for the honors, positive start. Just got to find a way to, to not get into the penalty trouble. It's easier said than done. And with a weak penalty kill, we've talked about it a lot, but just stop putting them in situations like that. That's the biggest key for them. Yeah, and just to expand on the Laviolette, <laughs> Pelix, Abinajad thing, because we got to talk about it. Yep. I mean, we all saw it. We all have eyes. Obviously, this was an inc- incidental thing, and, and I think it was just a little gamesmanship on the part of Peter Laviolette just trying to kind of rile his players up and, and maybe change the narrative for the referees too, being like, hey, you know, you guys missed one there. You owe us, that sort of thing, you and know? I, and I understood the Dobson one. That, I mean, that's a boarding yeah. penalty. Yes. Nothing besides, like, it's just boarding. And sure, could the Rangers have tied it up with 15 seconds left with the empty net and the six on four? They absolutely could have. 1,000%. percent yeah. you have seen it. Um, yeah, I didn't love him going after it. We talked to Pelic the next day. Guys had head injuries in back-to-back years. He said he felt sick. Seeing his advantage mm. on the ice. This is a guy that right. would never, first off, has never done that. And it's, again, you watch it. Yeah. Clearly runs into him. The Dobson one, Dobson, I'm just playing hard there. It is what it is. And he doesn't care what other coaches are going to say. Yeah, and that happens to every team all the time where you have these borderline plays along the boards and, and you wonder if it was a boarding penalty or a hit from behind. And sometimes they get called, sometimes they don't, and nobody understands why. There's just a lot of things in this game of hockey where – you know, when you when you try to contextualize everything, everybody has a different interpretation, and you just hope that the referees get it right in their minds. And again, we, there's so many fans, a lot of fans, we don't want the refs impacting the end of games. Right. And they see this, that's just a hard, I mean, that's in the playoffs, and they call that in the playoffs. That's a tough, tough thing. When we'll see when playoff hockey comes around, usually the first game or two, you finally, you kind of see, okay, this is what's going to be called, this is what's not, which is vital for the players to understand what lines they can cross and what they can't. But in that game, as a playoff type of game, a hard fought game till the end. You love to see it. Obviously, the Ranger fans wish that there was penalty called. Fortunately, that's not what happened. Yeah, and I'm actually a little surprised that Laviolette walked it back. I figured he would just move on without saying a word. So, so he walked back um, the comments about Dobson saying he was just heated, but then he was asked about the Pellick situation. If you mm-hmm. watch, and he goes, "We're moving on." So he didn't own up to okay, flipping out about enough. that. But I guess you'll take what you can take at this All point. Right. It is what it is. Either way, a big two points for the yep. New York Islanders, and that brings us to the following game against the Montreal Canadiens, where the Islanders dominate play, but it still took overtime. It was a close game. Varlamov was good when he needed to be. I think he only faced about 14 shots, yep. but he stopped the ones that he needed to. He made some big saves in that game, too. Palmieri gets the overtime winner. Another huge two points against a team that the Islanders need to beat, and you, you, you rewind to the, year, to the week previous where you had games against Chicago, yep. Columbus. These are teams that the Islanders struggled against earlier in the season. You know, certain teams like that, the Sharks, we always bring it up. But but these are teams that the Islanders have, have, have had an issue with this year, and you just don't know what you're going to get regardless of the opponent. But the Islanders finally look like they're in a mode now where they see the task at hand, they know who they're playing against, they know the time of year that it is, and they're getting the wins. And you're seeing that, that desperation. You saw it against yes. the Rangers. You're yes. seeing... You know, guys like Brock Nelson dive, Barzal diving in front of yeah, shots. I yeah. mean, you saw a lot in that Ranger game that carried over. Again, you think the Islanders would be more concerned if they weren't getting the chances in games. They were getting a lot of chances. Montebo played well. It goes yeah. to overtime, and yeah. then Kyle Palmieri. What a shot. I mean, I talked to Pacheco <laughs> after the game. He goes, he practices this 500 times in yeah, practice. Yeah, I saw the tweet. He's yeah. good at it. And for a guy like Palmieri, he's been unreal this year. He's been the most consistent Islander since Waz walked through the doors. When he's healthy, he's showing that he's a clear 25-goal scorer. 
every year. And, and that shot, and first off, he's come up clutch a lot. You have the empty net. He has goals and he had goals in four straight games. Yep. After that, he had a couple empty net goals, which is ultra vital to closing games out and not blowing games. If they scored empty net goals early in the year, all those collapses, a lot of those probably don't happen if you score in the empty net. So right. Palmieri's been great for this team. He's showing really why they brought him in and signed him to that extension again injuries are going to kill you when you're not available and you can't find your rhythm but what Palmieri has done since Waz walked in the door has to be studied because it's been fantastic yeah it's been excellent so another big win and, and again Varlamov coming up big in a, in a game where he didn't see a lot of shots and I know there's a lot of talk about goalies where it's hard for them to get into yep. a rhythm if they're not facing a lot of pucks so he was still able to stay steady make some big saves and and it makes me think of all the Islander fans going into the past couple of seasons talking about, ah, trade Varlamov, get the money off the cap, put it towards a, another asset. And, I mean, this is the reason why you don't trade Semyon Varlamov. You have your starting goalie, Ilya Sorokin, who long-term is and should be the guy who carries the most of the weight here, right, and should get you the wins. But he hit a rut, as any goalie can do. You can be a Vesna winner every year, but sometimes you get these goalies that, that'll hit a rut. Sorokin hit one at a, at a very poorly time, <laughs> bad yeah. time, let's say. And Varlamov's able to step in and get those wins and, and try to think about who the Islanders might have put in for those games if he was not around. So I think this speaks to the decision that Lou Lamarillo made to, to keep Varley around was a good one. Well, that's the mindset, right? If Varley's not here. So there's two options. One, you bring in a backup goalie for cheap, or you call up a guy like Scar who's really struggled. Yeah. But more, I mean, more often than not, what they'd probably do with Sorokin struggling is keep throwing him out there and hopefully that he figures it out. Which is, I don't think not, it's the recipe. Not a great plan. No, no, not at all. And I think the Rangers and Islanders are in the same boat. So Sturkin struggled the entire first half. If they don't have Jonathan Quick playing the way Jonathan Quick played, they're in trouble. The same thing right. with Varlamov is, it's not only that you have a backup goalie that could help you win games. You have a backup goalie that could steal you games, which he did. Exactly. He did it against Nashville. Right. He does it against pretty much every game he's played in, he's kind of stolen. So it's great problem to have that the Islanders have a quote-unquote goalie controversy now, but like I said, in a big game where the Islanders can now clinch after Varley started three straight, going 3-0-0, he's back in between the pipes in a, in a win-and-in situation, and that's a great problem to have, where Sorokin finds his game, you want to see him probably build on that, and hopefully he's ready to go locked in, whether he plays against Pittsburgh or in the first round at some point, but yeah, Varlamov, to me, is, is the guy you go with right now. He's earned every chance to keep going here. I, I agree with you 100%. And speaking of Sorokin getting his game back, he has a great showing against the Rangers. He he looked as steady as he had in, in a long time. I feel like, you know, we talked about the Columbus game. He got the win. I feel like he was shaky in that game. We talked about that. And he gets in against the Rangers. He plays well. They get a point out of it. And look, I mean, they can look at that game and say, I think the Islanders played an excellent game, even though they got the loss. I mean, you know you know my feelings on overtime and on the shootout especially. You know, that's that's garbage time for me. But somebody's got to get that extra point. Sorokin not so great in the shootout, but it is what it is. But it's good to see this late in the season that he's able to bounce back. And hopefully if Wad does have to turn to him or does decide to turn to him in the playoffs, that he'll be able to, you know, put a good performance out there. But this is a game where the Islanders battled. You can even make the argument that the Islanders scored more goals in regulation. One just got called back because that offside call, which was the right call, but an overall good game. I know you had some things to say about Engvall on Twitter. I did as well. I thought he had an excellent game against the Rangers the other night, and it's it's a good sign if he's a guy who's going at this time of year. We saw it last year in the second half with Engvall what he can do. We saw it in the playoffs. That line of him, Nelson, and Palmieri was the best. Now, obviously, Engvall is playing on the third line now, but the, the speed that he showed yesterday without the puck was, to me, the biggest thing. I mean, you saw him mm -hmm. opening up down the middle for passes. Right. Which, there was a practice early on in Wah's tenure where, where Engvall was struggling to open up, and Wah lost it. The first time Wah had kind of flipped that on a player on the ice. And you see, see the move that he makes, by the way, taking home out to put Fashing in. Mm -hmm. Talk about Fashing, yeah. two assists. Great performance by him going Excellent. to the dirty area. Something that Holmstrom just has to do a better job mm -hmm. of, especially in playoff time. But I think it put emphasis on Engvall that, okay, I have to raise my game. Back-to-back -back games for him, really good. But again, speed away from the puck, becoming a pass option. He had a check. Yeah, along, you know, he made contact. He <laughs> yes, used his body. He used the he, body, yes. Which, again, it's something we joke about. But <laughs> right. when you have a guy that has a stick length that, that, that's that long, you don't have to be physical. But when mm. you do bring that physical element, getting on the forecheck, it does a lot. And I think Engvall has to find a way to be a little more. I'm not saying he's got to go in. Crush no, guys, he doesn't have to lay guys out. But you see a lot of circumstances with Engvall where there's, you know, Battles for pucks along the boards, and he just 
I just feel like he doesn't get in there deep enough to to, to win those battles. He, he comes away losing a lot of those battles, and I don't think he's he's using his body enough. He's got a big frame. Get in there. You know, put your shoulder on a guy, and he just doesn't typically do that. And I thought just dumping and chasing, going after pucks, not going south, which has gotten into mm-hmm. a lot of trouble. I just right. thought that was a perfect example of when Engvall's on his game, how much of a difference maker he can be. Now, we have not seen that enough. This year, especially when you get a seven-year deal, you got to hope that you see that more. And, and the whole desperation playing that way, oh, why, why hasn't that been there the entire year for some, a lot of these guys? Why is that, not, why is that just showing up now? Mm-hmm. That being said, all that matters is the next game and the next shift. And if he's going to show that now going forward, that's, re- that's a really good sign for the Islanders. Better late than never. And if he can keep it up, that's great. That's the question now is if, if he can be consistent with it. Because if he disappears over this next stretch, it's not going to do the Islanders much good. But a good sign. We're glad to see it. And let's talk about a, a negative during that game, 0 for 5 power play. And you, you, you spoke on Dobson being out. Obviously, that's a huge factor. But we all know that the Islanders were stuck on, struggling on the power play without Dobson as well. So this is something that can end up being a huge problem for the Islanders if and when they get into the playoffs, depending on how the, the refs use their whistles. Thankfully for the Islanders, they, they tend to not use them as much when the playoffs come around. But it's still going to be an issue if this team yeah. can't find ways to put pucks in the net. And it was essentially the difference between getting that second point against the Rangers the other night And I have to say, I I tweeted a couple of times, I was very surprised that there weren't those quote-unquote makeup penalties for the Rangers later in the game because you had five for the Islanders, and usually that's just the way it goes. And, you know, the the referees are are keen to kind of look out for infractions to to even those calls up a little bit, but maybe that's a credit to the Islanders for playing a little more discipline, although although I do think they got away with a couple the other night against the Rangers. I feel like there was a couple that could have been called. I I remember watching the game and like, wow, Lee could have got called for that. Wow, Sezikas could have got called for that that so they got a little bit lucky and they still get the point but let's face it the special teams especially on the power play side is an issue yeah we thought that they had turned a page with the power play early on this year it was not never it was never going to be an elite one two but it was 10th for a while top half of the league yeah for sure and you're seeing now and dobson being out is not an excuse again you talked about it the power mm-hmm. play has struggled with dobson lineup now it's much worse when he's not there clearly they have to next man up kind of mentality again riley's going to be there like i said earlier but it's just the passing. Barzell forced a lot on the power play early, mm-hmm. trying to go up uh, across the ice where you can't do that, especially when you're playing against an aggressive PK. They score short in a goal, which kills you in that game as well. You don't, you don't just go over five. The worst thing you do is when your power play is not clicking is allow a short in a goal. Which? Yep. And I, I think, too, as Waz talks so much about how got to keep it simple. Mm-hmm. Look at last one. I, I just always remember these little things. In the, in the, in the playoffs against Carolina, Islanders dominate 5-on-5. Five five. I think they scored one power play goal on 10 tries in that series, or 15 tries, whatever yeah, it was. Yeah, something ugly like that. It was a Sebastian Ajo basic wrist shot from the point. Right. Bad palmary mm-hmm. tips. Mm-hmm. The, the final game of the year against Montreal, Ajo, point shot, lead tips. No crazy passing. Just get it to the point. Get the shots through. Dobson struggled this year in getting the shots through enough, but the passing isn't crisp. When the passing's not crisp, Barzal said today that they're a little out of sync. We saw them go back now. Nelson's back on that top unit. Um, they have Engvall back. So I think they get, they got to find a way to move on without Dobbs, and we don't know how long he's going to be out. But sure, you're going to play more 5-on-5 five five in the playoffs than power play, but it is instrumental to success in the playoffs to get a power play. Even if you don't score, just get shots on goal, make the goalie move, tire him out. That's the biggest thing. And if your power play isn't going to work, then your penalty kill has to. Yeah. Because the other team is still going to get calls too, so it might be it might be two minutes or so that the other team isn't having possession of the puck, maybe hopefully not scoring, right? But they're eventually going to get up a man up on themselves. So if that happens, the Islanders are going to have to keep. You know, the, the penalty killers look better. It's definitely yeah. looked improved. But if the power play is going to continue to struggle, it has to get to that level that we were used to over the past few years, where they can kind of balance out the ineptitude on the power play so that at least they can keep the goals away when they go on the uh, man down. Yeah, they're, they're t- just looking now here. Over their last seven games, they're two for their last 19 on the power play. That's not going to cut it. No. And they're, Again, they're getting the chances five on five. We've seen a lot of games where they get a lot of chances that really don't score. Power play is huge to give you a chance, but also just build momentum. Maybe you had really, three really good looks, you don't score. Now you pull that into your five on five play and you score. The problem is when you're not scoring in the power play, not getting chances, can't even break into your own zone. And then you allow a short right. and a goal. I mean, the mindset's got to—it's got to be mentally mm. very difficult to then go and play five on five with the confidence. And those top guys have to get it done. Barzal said today too that the onus is on him and Horvat. They have to do a better job, which is great to hear from a guy that's been so vocal and so accountable. Mm. And same thing with Horvat. Right. That they're not looking at the Dobson thing, saying, "Oh, Dobson's not there." That's an easy—that's an easy excuse. We don't have Dobson. But Barzal today said, "You know, me and, and Bo have to do a much better job." I think their power—you know—they're confident on their power play when they're moving. Yep. 
They feet. get stationary a lot when they're struggling, and they're just basically sending the puck back and forth, you know, from the point back down to the sideboards, and, and they're waiting for an opportunity that they're just not creating for themselves. They need to move their feet, and when they do that, they, they find more success, and, and I think they just need to throw more pucks at the net and not look for that perfect shot. I get it. You want to get the, the penalty killers moving. You want to get the goaltender moving, obviously, but even, even when you're not, all it takes is that juicy rebound through a screen that drops to a guy like Andrews Lee or Kyle Palmieri so they can put it in the net. So hopefully get a a little more shots towards the net and and we see a little more success in the power play. You nailed it. Getting shots to the net and getting to the net. Pajot said today that they just have to do a better job at getting to the front. There are rebounds. Goalies are are too good nowadays. If they see it, they're probably going to control it. But with the screens in front, things that you have to to crash the net and and get those loose pucks. But I just think once they get into the zone, which, again, Dobson not being there anymore, Barzal is the one that carries it in, but usually drops it to Dobson in the zone. Mm-hmm. Or Horvath, who gives it right to Dobson. They have to figure out a way now to move forward. Maybe not that it's a blessing that Dobson's gone, but maybe they figure out a creative way to get more chances now that Dobson's not there, which may help when Dobson gets back. Because like sure. you said, they were stationary. You pretty much knew what they were going to do. Perimeter, 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 maybe right. one time. Mm-hmm. Now with Dobson out, it's going to force them to do something different. So maybe that'll help them and get the power play going. Yeah, for sure. And let's talk about the goaltending a little bit like yep. we were before. So you have the big game tomorrow, winning in. It's all done, right? So... Let's say Varlamov gets the win. Maybe you give Sorokin the start against Pittsburgh yeah. just to basically get the ice under his feet before they go into the playoffs, right? But let's say tomorrow doesn't go the Islanders' way and they find themselves in a situation. Like, I think if they only get a point, they still have to worry about a couple of teams. And let's, yep. let's just assume that's the case. Who gets the start on Wednesday? Is it still Sorokin? I think or it, you go back to Varlamov. I think it matters how the loss happens. Sure. If Varley looks terrible and allows, you know, the stat, the styling doesn't matter. If the goals that are going in are, are bad, yeah. then yeah, if they lose 2 1 and it's two backdoor odd man rushes and Varley plays a good game, I think you give it to him. But that game for Sorokin against the Rangers was huge because I think oh, yeah. Waz always had the trust in Sorokin. He's talked about it numerous times, but Sorokin gets lit up against the Rangers. Regardless of what Varlamov does on, on Monday, how can you go back to Sorokin in, that, in a must, I agree. must win? So I, I agree. Think, think it depends how they lose. Sure. If they clinch, I think Sorokin gets that game just to give Varlamov a breath. I think Varley's going to start game one in the playoffs if they get in. But yeah, I think if Varlamov plays a good game, regardless of the result, he should get the game Wednesday. Um, but yeah, Varley's proven that he's the guy right now. I think it's his crease, and you I want agree. Sorokin to be mm-hmm. fresh for sure. But you got to win these games, and Sorokin has allowed soft goals in, in most of his starts as of late. That game against the Rangers, I don't think you could blame him at all for either goal that goes in there and the shootout's a shootout, but it's Varley's crease for me. All right, well, let's do a little what's on tap before we break for Ken Danico. And now, it's time for what's on tap. A look ahead at the Islanders' upcoming schedule. That's right, folks. It's time for what's on tap. Tap, and we got two games left in the regular season. Games 81 and 82. 81 is a big one against the New Jersey Devils tomorrow night. And look, like we said before, win it in. Get two points. You got nothing to worry about Wednesday. Wednesday is just a leisure game against the Pittsburgh Penguins. You can rest some players if you want. There is nothing at stake if they get two points against the Devils. So that's huge. As we've talked about, Semyon Varlamov is going to get the start. That's who Patrick Waugh wants in, the, in between the pipes to secure those two points. If they don't get the two points, then it gets a little hairier, and then they have to face the Pittsburgh Penguins, who are also fighting for their lives here to get into the playoffs. So that would make a crucial, huge game for the Islanders against the Pittsburgh Penguins. It's possible that even if they lose against the Devils tomorrow that they get in. Yep. Uh, we have to look and see what other results happen, and, and somebody could do the Islanders some favors. Maybe Washington loses, maybe Detroit loses, whatever the case may be but for now today's conversation we have two potentially huge games against the new jersey devils and the pittsburgh penguins yeah verlama hasn't faced the devils this year sorokin's got an all three oh two and one when you look at the last time they were at prudential center that that was a catastrophic loss that was a had a lead in the third period the devils tie it late lee fights and then they allow the go-ahead goal with like three seconds left and they lose that one they don't get a point they end up following it up with an overtime win against the carolina hurricanes but this is a Devils team without Jack Hughes, and they're a team that wants to you know, ruin the Islanders' playoff chances. This is a team that, there's a rivalry here. We know what happened last time they played. Lee, uh, Neon Nee with Heesher. Right. That happens, mm-hmm. and again, mm-hmm. a 4 nothing loss for the Islanders where they didn't come out playing strong hockey at all. So for the Islanders, again, gotta start, or you have to start strong. There's no excuse. This is a must-win for them. Sure, they don't have to win to get in, but for them, it, 
we talked to Barzal today. He doesn't want it to come down to no one wants to come down to to Wednesday hoping. They want it to get it done right. over with Monday. And what sort of confidence does that give anybody if they can't beat the Devils tomorrow in a win and in situation? Right? You're playing against a team who's tumble down the standings obviously haven't met expectations we'll talk to ken danico about <laughs> yeah. that a little bit more they have injury big injuries on the table here i mean this is a game that the islanders should go in and just wipe the floor with or at least win by a goal here let's let's just get into this game take the two points and let wednesday be a you know an easy going day for them but we've seen we've seen this happen to teams yeah. like look at look at pittsburgh last year all they had to do was beat Chicago last year, late in the season. They couldn't even do that. So you can get a surprise situation here. And, and these New Jer- Jersey Devils are not the Chicago Blackhawks of last year. They still have talent. They still have good players. So this is a game that the Islanders have to get up for. They have to come out strong in the early going like they did against the Rangers and, and maybe pot some early goals and then just take control of the game and, and, and coast themselves to two points. The Devils have a very young back end. And what you got to do is forecheck them and pressure them to make mistakes. They're young. They're still learning. That's been... Outside the goaltending, their defensive play has been terrible, which is why they've allowed so many goals and have struggled. So you got to get the pucks behind them and put pressure on them. But they're looking ahead to the Penguins. It's a team that's 5-1-1 one, one in their last seven games. They're going to play Nashville on Monday, which is right. going to be tough. Barry Trotz's squad have sure, yeah. been really good. So but this Penguins team, we talked about it last week. Uh, the, Crosby has turned it up, and the team has rallied behind him. And you don't want to leave it up to that. But Wednesday is going to be a monumental game for that for sure because even if the Islanders do clinch, Penguins are still going to try to, they have to win that game. The Islanders could ruin the Penguins' chances as well. Sure, sure. I mean, the, the Islanders aren't going to be looking to put them in a situation where they could potentially hurt themselves or anything. I mean, look, they're going to take it easy that game if they win tomorrow. Yeah, for sure. They might even rest a guy or two and just coast. They might be doing the Penguins a favor on Wednesday, so, you know, if they win yeah. tomorrow. But if that ends up being a game that has stakes for both teams, it's going to be much must-see TV. It's going to be Sidney Crosby versus Matt Barzell and, it's going to be a show, and, and, and as, as a hockey fan, I'd love to see it, <laughs> but as somebody who favors the New York <laughs> Islanders, I'd rather the Islanders just take care of business tomorrow. There's actually a situation, I don't know the exact situation, where if either team gets a point on Wednesday, if things don't go the way that the Islanders want to go, that mm-hmm. a point for both sides gets both teams in. Ah, so you could okay, situation where it's a third period and just put the buck in the corner, right, everyone's going to play for a tie. Right. That would be very interesting to see what happens there. But, yeah, Islanders take care of business Monday against the Devils. enough to worry about what happens in the Pittsburgh game. But, again, Pittsburgh is going to be fighting very hard. So oh, the yeah. Islanders make that a situation where one team has to win to get in and their team misses it or whatever the situation may be. It's going to be very tough to beat this Penguins team right now. Indeed, and we shall see what happens. So I want to thank everybody for tuning in to twitch.tv slash Hockey Night NY and all your favorite streaming and podcast providers. We're going to take a break. When we come back, Devils legend Ken Danico will be joining us. I don't want to hear it. It's over. I can't believe they fell short again. Yeah, but they played so well. They made it to the semifinals two years in a row. The semifinals aren't the cup. God damn it. Heat was lightning. They'll get another shot at it next year. I don't even want to talk about it anymore, all right? They lost, okay? Let me just sit here and enjoy the one thing that makes me a little bit happy. This fresh, delicious, tasty, meaty, turkey-filled blue line combo. I eat three every day to help keep me strong. Hey, Donnie, can I have one of those? Coming right up. Talk about a blast from the blue line. Blue line deli and bagels. Our goal is to make you a hero. Attention all artists, storytellers, and creators of all kinds. It's time to make your content stand out above the rest. And Floored Media is the place to make your visions become a reality. Maybe you want to elevate your podcast and answer video. Or turn that novel you wrote into an audiobook. Or maybe you just need the right space to produce your daily vlog. Whether you're a seasoned veteran or just starting out, Floored Media has the professional facilities, exceptional staff, and intimate atmosphere to breathe life into your creative passions at every step of the process. Thanks for giving some time to our sponsors. Ready to talk more aisles? The train rolls on right here on Hockey Night in New York. That's right, folks. The train rolls on here at 
Hockey Night in New York, and it is our pleasure to welcome on to the program Devils legend, Mr. Ken Danico. Ken, the Islanders have a big game against the New Jersey Devils tomorrow night. Obviously, a winning in situation for them. The Devils had a, a, a tough year this year. Injuries, guys going down, high expectations leading in. I just want to start by asking you, what happened with the New Jersey Devils where they, they fell short of their expectations this year? Oh, boy. Uh, we need a long time. I mean, obviously, it uh, was not a year that they expected or any of us did. But having said that, I certainly, for one, know things are not always linear. And the jump they had made from one year to the next was probably too big of a leap. It was fun. It was great. They won a playoff round against their rival, the, the Rangers. So you come into this season with higher expectations and... You know, teams are more prepared for you. They're not sneaking up on anybody. And it just they, they just couldn't find consistency. They never lost more than three games in a row all season long. That's not bad. They never won more than three games all season long in a row. So it, it just was one of those years, up, down, win, lose, win, lose, win a couple. And, yes, goaltending was a big factor. Goaltending, uh, you guys know, it's as important as anything. Last year, VTech... Uh, uh, had a 9-10 save percentage, played extremely well, made the timely saves that you need from your goaltenders in tight games. Schmidt was uh, really good as a young player, and, and we saw what he did in the playoffs coming in uh, in Game 3 against the Rangers and kind of catched, uh, caught lightning in a bottle. But and, and I think he's got a bright future, but it was a little too much for these young guys, Dawes and Schmidt, to handle this year. They had flashes where they played very well, but uh, it just, uh, between all the goaltending, it didn't work out, and it's really hard to win hockey games with goaltending. That's not making an excuse, fellas, it's just that and injuries. Jack Hughes and Nico Heischer were in and out, not playing uh, stretches in the first 40 games as one was injured, the other guy was injured. That hurts. The team's not quite there yet as far as depth to, to be missing key pieces, and Oh, boy, did I forget how important Dougie Hamilton is on the back end as well on the power play. When you need a big goal, he's a game changer. So those are a lot of the issues, but it is what it is. You learn from it and uh, should be a pretty sour taste in the Devils and, and, and this young core as well. I think they've got an excellent group. They need to add a little bit. But, I, and I will say, if they happen to have Allen and Kackelman, we may not be talking uh, here, talking about... Um, not being in the playoffs if they could have had them 30 days earlier. Ifs and buts, uh, but that's the way it goes. And they learn from it, and uh, hopefully uh, they'll become a perennial playoff team, which I think they're very capable of. Hey, Ken, Stefan here. Thanks so much for joining us um, today. I just wanted to ask you about two young defensemen. you got Luke Hughes and Nemec. Just what have you seen from them as they try to develop and take the next steps in their career? And, and that's another thing. We, you know, the Devils were much younger on the back end with Paul, the two guys you mentioned, Nemec and Hughes, some of the veteran guys. And, and you could say it to pretty well throughout the Devils lineup. Everybody had careers years last year. This year, everybody dipped a little bit. It happens. You just can't all do it together. Another reason why uh, they're sitting where they are and, and only have one game left against the Islanders tomorrow. But Nemitz and Hughes, I mean, first let's start with Luke Hughes. I mean, he, he he's a special player, and he's going to be Outstanding! I can't wait till next year or maybe even year three to see where he's at as he continues to grow and balance out understanding the defensive side of the game. His skating ability is remarkable. It's second to none. Uh, I think he broke a devil's record this year for, for points as a rookie from the back end. So, yeah, the offense is there. Uh, the, the hockey IQ, the intelligence, and the great skating ability to be able to make plays. Now it's about learning, you know, your your end of the rink, and, and he's gotten so much better. He uses his stick well. The last month's been really solid for Luke Hughes after going through some growing pains like any young defenseman or, or anybody, really, uh, coming in the National Hockey League in the rigors of an 82-game schedule. I think he's been uh, – he's right on pace for for being uh, – or kind of what exactly we expected. Uh, flashes of brilliance, um, things he can do that other guys can't because it was – uh, legs and is, is like I said, his great uh, skating ability, but it, it's learning everything. And, and he's got to grow into his body. He's a big guy that once he gets a little physically stronger, a little more mature, he's going to be able to handle, 
handle uh, the board work and all the little 50-50 battles because he's going to be a big kid. He just needs to fill out a little bit. He's already you know, he's 6'2 from a height standpoint, but I, I, I'm really excited about him. I think he's going to be a star in this league, no question about it. Uh, Nemitz on the flip side, two-way guy. Just a good, solid, a little, probably a little stronger already at a young age than Luke right now as far as uh, the lower center of gravity and being able to ha- handle one-on-one battles. Did he go through some lumps along the way? Of course he did. Any, any young player will, in particular, the responsibility young defensemen have. But uh, I think the Devils are in really good hands with these two young guys. Do they need to support him in the offseason and add a veteran or two uh, that just knows how to defend and is big and maybe a little more physical? Absolutely. But these two guys will be a top pairing or, or top uh, two defensemen, three defensemen in your lineup uh, for a long, long time. But yeah, so this year you have to go through some ups and downs, some mistakes. That's just part of the process. And uh, uh, that was a little bit of some of the devil's problems at the back end this year as well. Besides the goaltending, uh, they didn't bail each other out kind of thing. Is The veteran guys too are responsible. They, they just didn't play quite as well as they did last year. And Dougie Hamilton, like I said, was a huge hole, but love the two kids. I think they're going to be really good for a long time. Absolutely, Ken. And, you know, the Devils, uh, they have the opportunity to play spoiler here against the New York Islanders, and, and unfortunately for them, they, they don't have a postseason to look forward to. The, the game obviously doesn't have a lot of stakes. And when you see players like this and, and young players on a team like this, how do they get up for a game when they know there's not a lot of stake for them? Well, look, anytime you play a team in your division, it doesn't matter where you're at or, or really nothing to play for from the standpoint of uh, it's one more game and, and you're finished for the season. I mean, they've had success against New York this year, 3-0 and against the Islanders, I believe, and, and they want to keep that going. Every Look, it's all – every game, regardless of where you're at or if it's game 82 and, and you're not going to class, it, it, it is a learning curve because so there's – it's a process of, of understanding uh, playing a team that needs the game, playing, you know, in these types of situations. It, you, you can uh, lean on it in a playoff game next year. I mean, all these things are add up, one play, one period, whatever it may be. And they're pros. you got to play. You play right. to win. You play to compete every night. Management looks at that. Uh, I mean, obviously, when you have a disappointing season or you under uh, like uh, most of the Devils players will tell you, and all of us say, they, they want to finish strong. So, look, the Islanders are going to have to play hard to beat them, I'll tell you that, because they know exactly that uh, everything is an addition, especially for young guys. Every moment, even veteran guys, they want to finish their season on a high note. Don't care who you are. If you don't have that kind of mentality, uh, then you, know, you might not be part of it moving forward in the future. Hey, Ken, have you seen a, a difference in the team just the way they've been playing since Travis Green took over as the interim head coach? Oh, man, I, you know what? I, I mean, Travis has, has got a lot of passion and heart. I mean, that's what I love. I mean, look, uh, I, I think coaches take too much blame and sometimes they get too much credit. Uh, I love Lindy as well. I mean, the guy's been a veteran guy for a long time around the league. He couldn't stop pots. He couldn't make plays. Uh, you know, they, they coach, they preach what they uh, they expect from their team. And, yeah, it's been better, I think, a little bit under Travis. Still, the wins weren't as consistent enough to, to get them a playoff team to become a playoff team this year. But, uh, you know, he had a lot, a lot of things to, you know, change a little bit, get guys to understand what he expects from them. And I, I just feel they were – much better defensively, no question. Uh, they start to uh, play a lot uh, more united, structured, under Travis Green. And, and we'll see where we go from here. I mean, obviously, there's going to be a, uh, a thorough process with management uh, and seeing and interviewing coaches, whether that happens to be Travis Green moving forward next year or whoever it may be. I, I know they're going to really um, do some a, a deep dive and and what's available, but I, I've, I've enjoyed Travis. I, I've talked to him a lot. I, I know his thought process. I know he, his competitiveness. I think a coach needs that kind of fire, and 
I'd be fine if it was Travis Green, uh, but for me, you've got to do your due diligence. That's all. Ken, what do you just make Moving of this? Forward, I mean, yeah. What do you just make of this playoff race in the East right now? Well, I think it's fantastic for the game. I mean, the I, I, I've always said it. Everybody says it. The competitive balance in the National Hockey League right now is at an all-time high. I believe it is just getting in and you've got a shot. I would say legitimately, I can name 10 teams that I believe can win the Stanley Cup right now. So that's what makes it so unpredictable. We always see upsets, obviously, but it's that close. And just look at what's going down to the wire. I mean, obviously, uh, in the East and where we talked about the Devils a lot, um, nobody really wanted it for quite some time. Nobody was consistent. Everybody kept winning two, losing three, winning a couple, uh, losing a handful. So nobody took charge. The Islanders started to near the end. Their goaltending again played extremely well. For me, that's the biggest part for the New York Islanders is they've got two excellent goaltenders, and that gives them an advantage. Um, but teams like Washington, teams like Philly, where they couldn't get a save, or the Flyers wouldn't be in the predicament they're in. They couldn't get a save for, for 10 games. All of a sudden, for the last two, uh, Arison's done a really good job yeah. and played well, beating the Rangers and Devils one nothing yesterday. So uh, it's so unpredictable. It, 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 the West is a pot, is probably a little deeper than the East, in my opinion, right now. But uh, that's why what's going to make the class so damn exciting. I, and I'm really looking forward to it because I just, like a lot of people, have no idea which way this is going to go. No idea till last day of the season who's going to be in the right. playoffs. Uh, in particular, in the East, really. For sure, Ken, no doubt. Definitely going to be an exciting playoffs. And with the New York Islanders, there's there's certainly a lot of um, Devil alumni over there, part of the Devil's family with Lou Lamarillo and John McClain and even his son over there and, and Kyle Palmieri obviously being a, a former Devil. Do you find yourself keeping an extra eye or extra tabs on the Islanders because you have some familiarity with those guys? Well, first and foremost, uh, you know, Lou Amarillo is like a, like a second father to me or an uncle. I mean, uh, the utmost respect for him. I mean, we've been through a lot together. We had a lot of success together. Um, and there's no one more loyal than Lou Amarillo. So anytime I get to catch up with him, uh, I did last time we played on the island and, and spoke with him for about an hour in his office. And then there's nothing like it. Lou Amarillo is uh, a big reason why I'm fortunate enough to have three Stanley Cup championships uh, that I was part of uh, because he was our architect and he really, you know, gave us that uh, attitude we need to be a champion because every team, like we talked about now with the balance in the league, even more so than my era, it's imperative. You have to have guys that understand and character and what it takes. And I don't think anybody knows that better than Lou for, for certain from my standpoint. So... Yeah, of course. I, I always watch. I, I mean, when we plays my team, of course I want to beat the you-know-what out of them. That's just the way it is. It's, uh, it's in my DNA. I, I'm a I'm a lifer. I'm a devil guy through and through. I bleed the colors. Uh, Lou was for a long time, and now he's moved on first Toronto and now the New York Islanders. But uh, I don't have to watch anymore. I watch hockey 24-7 anyway. So anyway, awesome. but when, when, when it's to do with uh, Lou, Johnny Mack, who I won a cup with, obviously. And, you know, real nice to see his his son excelling and, and doing a really good job in our role, you know, as a, as a role player and chipping in. I mean, and I can't imagine how exciting that is for, for Johnny Mack as far as watching his son. Uh, I would believe it's probably more exciting than uh, him scoring any kind of goal or championship, just watching your son, you know, get his opportunity to fulfill his dream as well. So, yeah, obviously I'm going to watch him, but I watch him. I, I, I love the game. I love the intrigue of the playoffs, like I just mentioned. And uh, may the best team win. And sometimes it's a bounce, it's a break. You got to get fortunate. But I just think it's going to be a whale of a playoff this year. Ken, you talk about Travis Green and the passion that he shows. Uh, Patrick Watt behind the Islanders bench now. Just what are your initial thoughts when you found out he was hired? And what have you seen really from the Islanders since he's walked through the doors? Well, it's been very up and down, right? It doesn't happen overnight. I mean, obviously, they, you know, had won six in a row at one point, lost six in a row until they've gotten back and right of the ship to, to get themselves right where they need to be. To, you know, I know it's still not 100%, but pretty pretty close as far as being a playoff team, but you can't take it for granted. Look, he's a winner. He's one of the greatest goaltenders of all time. I mean, 
all the great players and the ones that I played with as well in the Hall of Famers like Patrick Watt, they don't accept they don't accept losing. They don't accept uh, you know uh, nothing but a hundred, hundred and ten percent, as you like to say, from every player. Uh, so they just have that internal drive, and, he, and he's no different. They, and you can see it. And I saw it when he coached Colorado. To tell you the truth, I mean, you can tell he's a guy. Uh, I think he's gotten to play more, a little more back to their identity. I think that's maybe what was missing. Look, the Islanders. And I'm going to be brutally honest. Uh, They've got good players. Are they the most talented team? Absolutely not. Do they have great goaltending? Do they have to rely on that and rely on their defensive structure? They'll tell you that. That's how they had success over the last handful of years in making playoffs and stuff. So I think they got caught in between for a while there. It seems that he's gotten them dialed more in the team. You know, the, the difficult team to play against. Big, strong, uh, you know, hard to play against. And that's what will make them successful in the playoffs uh, once they get there. No doubt, Ken. And, and last one from me. You look at this exciting playoffs that you were talking about before. Uh, are there any heavy hitters here that you're looking at that you think might be a you know, favorite out west, favorite out east, or, or you think it's just going to be a dogfight to the end? I think it's going to be a dogfight. But, but, but obviously, you look at some of the top teams, the Rangers. I mean, look, they're, they are where they are for a reason. Uh, fighting for a president's trophy. Carolina, are they ready to take that next step? I think they might be. They added a couple of pieces, maybe something they've missed in the last uh, few seasons and against one of Kuznetsov has been an incredible playoff player, especially when the Capitals won a Stanley Cup and, uh, so are they ready to jump to the next level, but the team I'm, I'm looking at, which you know, they lost guys, but they, they're fighting for the President's Trophy as well, and they won the President's Trophy last year as the Boston Group I just have a feeling that you always look at, and I say it because my reasoning is I think they can be dangerous because they had that taste last year and that sour taste in their mouth after being up 3-1 in round one, breaking a single season record for wins and points all time on their way to a President's Trophy. Uh, I've been on teams where you come close, you have heartbreaking losses, disappointing losses, upsets like they did against the Panthers. I think it's going to harden them and, and make them that much stronger come come this year, this playoffs, this go around. But again, man, you might as well flip a coin and pick out of a hat. I think it's that close. Out east, Dallas looks great. Yeah, Colorado's a good team, but uh, I'm not underestimating the Vancouver Canucks. Uh, but one of my favorites as well is the Edmonton Oilers. I think they might be poised and ready. I think they're more well equipped for playoff hockey now if their goaltender continues to just just be there for him and make the saves he needs to and give them a chance. That's a team I think could go all the way. But you, And you never count out the Vegas Golden Knights have flown under the radar because they're the defending champs. I can go on and on. How about the Winnipeg Jets going into Colorado? That's regular season. Right. Slate is late clean, winning 7 nothing and beating Dallas 3 nothing a couple nights earlier in Dallas on a road trip. Truly remarkable. So they're feeling good about their game. They've got, as I talk about the Islander goaltending, duo. Winnipeg's got as good a duo as anybody in the National Hockey League as well, and that could carry them a long way. So, I looked at dark horses like that, even though they had a lot of points this year. People are going to still consider the Winnipeg Jets a dark horse to win the Stanley Cup or or advanced out of the West. But I just don't think you can take anybody for granted this year. There's just so many so many teams, like I said, uh, and I'm sure everybody feels it. So, these brackets, when we fill these brackets out. I I mean, you might as well throw darts in the dark, really. (laughs) I think it's going to be that that difficult in my estimation. And we're going to go, wow, I didn't see that one. Oh, wow, I didn't see that team beating that team. You know what I mean? So it's going to be a lot. That's what makes it intriguing. That's what makes it great. That's why we love our playoffs uh, for our sport. Uh, There's nothing like it. The best playoffs in all the sports are best game. We always feel that way because of the unpredictability. No doubt about it, Ken. You're absolutely right. It's going to be a lot of fun to watch. And, and listen, we cannot thank you enough for giving us your time today. Uh, awesome, awesome stuff. We really appreciate it and uh, hope to talk to you again down the road. All right, fellas. Uh, take care. Pleasure being on with you. You too, Ken. Take care. Thanks See a lot. You, All right. See that you, was New Jersey Devils legend Ken Danico breaking it down, talking about the potential 
playoff dark horses, playoff favorites, and we'll see how it goes. But it's going to be an awesome playoffs, regardless of yeah. who gets in. We still got to figure out what happens here in the East. We got a little uh, positional situation going out in the West, too. We don't know who's playing who yet. That We already know what teams are getting in, but the East still has about five teams trying to cram themselves into two spots. So it's going to be a lot of fun to watch. Uh, we'll take one more break, but before we do, I want to tell everybody about Main Street Board Game Cafe in Huntington Village on Long Island's North Shore. Games for sale and for open play. Food and drink, beer and wine, fun and friends. Bring the magic of phones down, eyes up, tabletop board games to your family. Our staff will help you find the right game from old favorites to the hottest new releases. We have everything from strategic to easy party games. Get off your screens for a night your family will remember. Looking for meetups to join our Magic the Gathering, Dungeons and Dragons, Locana, and organized play communities are welcoming for all. We also do parties and corporate events located at 307 Main Street in Huntington Village. Go to mainstboardgamecafe.com for more information. Main Street Board Game Cafe. Find your crowd. Unplug your game. And with that, we're going to take one more break. When we come back, it'll be time for the Hero of the Week. Islanders fans, Sunday night is hockey night in New York. Whether you were raised at the barn in Uniondale or born in the stable at Belmont, tune in to Hockey Night in New York. Catch us live from Floored Media in Rockville Center, Sunday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern, as we cover all things Islanders at twitch.tv slash hockey night NY. All episodes are also available on YouTube and all your favorite podcast providers. And for all you social butterflies, you can follow at Hockey Night NY on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram for all the latest updates. Hockey Night in New York. The best night of the week for any Islanders fan. Welcome back to the program, ladies and gentlemen. When you hear this song, that means it's time for the Hero of the Week, brought to you by the Blue Line Deli and Bagels Hero of the Week. And we just happen to be here at Blue Line Deli and Bagels at 719 West Jericho Turnpike in Huntington. So let's take off here with the Heroes of the Week. Stefan Rosner, what do you got? There are so many good uh, players that you could have chose from, but I'm going to go with Patrick Law. When Lou Amarillo hires Patrick Law, it's because Lou trusts Patrick's gut. And he's made some decisions right. as of late. Going with Varlamov, though he has, backed it up by his gut. The line changes he's made, even after wins, taking Holmes from out, putting Fashing in, that automatically works. Moving Engvall down to the third line, I just think with, this is the type of this part of the season where you need to trust your coaches doing the right thing to help you get wins. Not everything Waz is going to do is going to work, but right now, going with Varlamov, even going back to Sorokin, in a game that, you know, wasn't already guaranteed a playoff spot. You needed that win or to get a point at least. And going with a guy that struggled, even though he's been a little better as of late, definitely a gut move. It pays off. Like I said, the fashion move paid off. Engvall being on the third line with Lee and that line in general has been a lot better. So I think everything Waz done this past week, uh, sure, the players have to play, they have to score, they have to defend, the goalies have to make the saves. But Waz, mindset he's given to the team since he's walked in, but just trusting his gut has played a part in this Islanders going on the 6 on one stretch here. Yeah, he's made a lot of gut decisions over the past few weeks. We've talked about, too, even coming out of wins, yeah. changing up his lineup where we know in, in previous coaching regimes, usually they just stick with the guys that, that got the win before, right? So he, he doesn't have a problem with pulling a guy out, bringing a guy in, and, and a lot of those decisions have worked well. So hat tip to you. Nice little hero of the week with Appreciate Patrick Waugh. I'm going to give you mine now, and that is none other than Kyle Palmieri. Goals in four straight games, all big, big goals. Obviously, he got the OT winner. Beautiful shot against the Montreal Canadiens. You're also talking about most goals since 2015-16. He has 28 right now. Most points since 16-17 with 51 points right now. So this has been by far the best regular season for Kyle Palmieri in a New York Islander sweater. And we know what he can do in the playoffs. He is a clutch player, so hopefully we see more of that if and when the Islanders get into the postseason dance. I don't want to jinx anything here. It looks good, <laughs> but it's not official yet. So hopefully we see him putting in some more goals. But, folks, those are your heroes on the, of the week, and it is brought to you by the Blue Line Deli and Bagels. Half-price hero, which is the Godfather featuring Cappy Ham, Genoa Salami, Pepperoni, Provolone, Lettuce and Tomato, Oil and Vinegar on a Hero. Stop on in right here to Blue Line Delis and ba Deli and Bagels Huntington location in Huntington. Mention Hockey Night New York and get half off the Godfather. So that was the hero of the week. And why don't we take it now to the Snake Den? Welcome to the Snake Den with Jake the Snake Resent. 
great. I can hear it now. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, buddy. It's your time. Well, yeah. No, well, I have to ask. Did you do The Godfather because of Kyle Palmieri? There might have been. There may have been a link between Kyle Palmieri and The Godfather. I'm not going to lie. That's very clever. I like what you did there. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. The brain works every now and then. Yeah. Also, unlike our, unlike our uh, Bluetooth <laughs> on the board. <laughs> well, but, God. Too bad. But, Indeed. Uh, yeah, I don't want to jinx anything either. Things are looking good. Mm-hmm. So I just wanted to say that I'd rather the Islanders draw the Rangers than the Hurricanes. Okay. Why? Um, Tell, well, yes, please. Explain yourself. Well, first, firstly, the Rangers have one game left, 112 points, and their last game is against Ottawa. That's tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And then the Canes have two games left. They play Chicago tonight, and then they play Columbus. Right. So that looks like two wins probably for the Canes, but also the Rangers m- – should pick up a win against Ottawa, but I just should. think that the Islanders' style of play, mm. it would be so much more effective against the Rangers. Um, also, according to MoneyPuck.com, Carolina is second best in the league at 5-on-5 five five expected goals for, mm. whereas the Rangers are 22nd. That is a vast difference. Yeah, and I think that we all know the Islanders' best game is their 5-on-5 five five game by far. You stay out of the box against the Rangers, I think they can handle that series. You get into the box against the New York Rangers, they'll put you away. For sure, and, and we've seen already in, in playoffs past that the Islanders have struggled against the Carolina Hurricanes, even if you go back to that Brooklyn year. But uh, the Canes are just a tough out for the – I mean, they're tough out for anybody, but yep. they're a tough out just because, of, as you just said, how well they play five on five. They can play – you know they kind of beat the Islanders at their own game when they when they face in the playoffs the, the last couple of times, right? Where they they know how to play a a defensive lockdown type of style of hockey, where it's kind of like, all right, Islanders, you want to you want to lull us to sleep here? We can lull you back, you know, and, and we can play a low scoring game. And and they may not have the goaltenders that the Islanders have, but the talent that they have up and down the roster in front of the goaltenders is is good enough to beat almost anybody in this league. So yeah. I definitely hear what you're saying there, and it's and it's funny to say that by comparison to a Rangers team who may be about to win. The president's trophy yeah. and obviously has a ha, they have a lot of firepower themselves but you know you brought those numbers out and and the the five on five is the islanders bread and butter and it is not for the rangers and that could end up being the key yeah and also when the islanders and rangers face off you really just don't know what's going to happen there for sure it's a rivalry it could go anyway the island, i remember when the islanders would suck and they'd still somehow manage to beat a very oh, good yeah. rangers team and vice versa yeah so um, you, you never know i think that the fans would love it i know i would love it for sure Absolutely. Um, Give it to me. Even if, like, they play Carolina and they get past them and the Rangers get past them, you could still see the Rangers in round two. So I think that this is something that hockey fans here in New York have been vying for for so long. I know the last time it happened, I wasn't even a thought yet. So <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't a thought. You weren't a thought. There are not a lot of thoughts out there at that point. No, but, uh, no. The internet, the internet wasn't a thought? No, not really. Not really. That was in its infant stages as well. Yeah, it's been a long time. It's 94. Yeah, long, it's long, long time been a long time yeah, yeah. for sure yeah. and you make a great point too is and you do as well with the goaltending for carolina that's the concern but when you play strong enough in front of your goalie mm-hmm. like um like danico just said just have your goalie make the saves he has to make talking about edmonton right. there right. with skinner is that Har- islanders actually played the hurricanes pretty well this year two one and one right different animal in the playoffs and yes. i do think the islanders actually match up better against the rangers because of that five on five we saw in the playoffs with the Hurricanes. The Islanders were better 5-on-5 five five last year. Special teams just killed them, and the Hurricanes are even better now. Like getting Jake Gensel, getting Kuznetsov. Right. It's an elite team. So I think for the Islanders, both matchups would be difficult, but this is the playoffs. you got to find a way, and I, I think the Islanders do match up better against the Rangers. It would do a world of wonders for both fan bases. It's been quite some time yeah. since that. Let's see it. And, and to all you scaredy cats out there, <laughs> just embrace it. This whole, oh, I don't want to play the Rangers and lose and have give them bragging rights and all that. Let's put that stuff aside. Let's just see some amazing New York hockey that we haven't seen. I was about to say haven't seen in 30 years, but the truth is that series was not amazing. <laughs> that yeah. series was far from amazing. But I think I would like to think that this series would be much more exciting than that series was back in 94 because Ron Hextall isn't going to be between the pies for the Islanders yeah. this time, and I think that'll make a huge difference. But to, to both your guys' points, let's see some Islanders Rangers at first or second round. Let's do it. And Absolutely. I, th- I think, too, you look back and you look last year's, the Panthers played the Bruins. Everyone said there's no way the Bruins lose. Panthers are going to get steamrolled, and all of the pressure was on Boston. Right, And exactly. the Panthers win that series. And if, if you're the Rain, again, the Rangers aren't going to be upset to play anyone, get to the playoffs, whatever. But in that series, if the Islanders do match up against the Rangers in the first round, all of the pressure is on the Rangers. Hell yeah. So for the Islanders, they could definitely take advantage of that. The fan bases obviously will, will make that a, a, a must-watch game. I think it could go 7, 6, 7. I don't think it's going to be either way a sweep. It's just the way these two teams play. But 
The Islanders have a chance to do an upset because that's just how it is. The, all the pressure would be on the New York Rangers. Well, let's get there first. But this is as close as it's been maybe in a couple of years. They had The Islanders had a chance to meet them in the second round in 16 or 15 when they played the Capitals in the first round. They lost in Game 7 to the Caps. Had they won, we would have seen a second-round bout between the Rangers and the Islanders. It didn't work out. Hopefully we see something this year. Before we state the snake down, real quick, the, seri- uh, the COVID, when the season got short and they continued in the, in the summer, Point percentage wise, if the Islanders get that extra point in that last game, you or mentioned whatever, that. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Islanders play the Rangers in round one, but that's let's right. escape uh, the snake den. Now. I just want to talk about. Let's get the hell out of there. Isles fix. <laughs> so Islanders country. Get your daily fix of Isles news, highlights, and analysis by subscribing to Isles Fix, the only Monday through Friday Islanders newsletter sent directly to your inbox. Sign up for free or become a paid subscriber for added benefits at islesfix.substack.com. And now it's time for questions brewing. It's time for Questions Brewing. So go ahead, ask us a question. And so, uh, some te- yeah. technical difficulties today. How you doing? How's oh, your arm, buddy? I, I, oh, yeah, well, <laughs> you know, I, I, I think I'm doing everything but great right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, you got a big smile on your face. No, so I'm that's kidding. Good, but How could I be anything other than great? Great food, yeah. great place, great fans, great team, great friends, and uh, yeah, great guests. Were, were you, uh, obviously nothing nothing towards Ken, but were you dying for that interview to end just so that your arm could get a rest there? Was your arm I okay? I switched a couple times. <laughs> but like, <laughs> okay. Good thing I, you have, too. You might think it's easy to just hold this position. Right. But it's, yeah, it was really isn't. It really I, is a while. I was I was keeping uh, the corner of my eye on you a little bit just to make yeah. sure you are right. <laughs> I was feeling Wait, better. Wait, no. no. that position again? Oh, uh, it's this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, so it's like what Pellick did for 10 seconds in the neutral zone. And everyone flipped that. Wow. Oh, my God. Wow. Right. Wow. But don't, but nice Stephen, job. You should know. You're, you're holding phones and microphones in front of players oh, all day. That's the, true. The funniest, this is, the this funniest is thing not too easy. Is, it is painful. After a while, it is. Like, we were in a... Uh, we were in Florida, and you know Shannon was doing it, and her arm got tired, and she switched. And Wa goes, "You okay?" Ah. Her arm just goes, "Yeah, just you get tired. It's That's it's crazy. Funny. The phone weighs nothing, but I feel your pain." Yeah, no, it was uh, it was great though. We made it work. You, you, know. you took one for the team. We got a great interview out of Ken, so so we appreciate yes. that. And, uh, and look, now you, now you get to lead the charge on questions. And anyway, man. now we have some questions. Let's go. And we're going to start off with uh, Mr. Joey Pickles here. All righty, Joey Pickles. If the Isles clinch tomorrow, do we see Barzi and Horvat off on Wednesday? If they do, do we see Bolduc or Wallstrom on Wednesday? Or perhaps someone from Bridgeport? Let's start with Bridgeport. I don't think anyone's being called up. I think you'll get some players called up in the playoffs just mm-hmm. to bring them there. Mm-hmm. I, I, honestly, you don't want to see anyone get hurt. I have a hard time seeing Horvat allowing or Barzal even allowing them to not be in the lineup. I think it'll come down to resting players. Like I would, could see someone on the back in like a Bortuzzo. Maybe put Bolduc in, put Ajo on his offside, whatever the case may be. I don't think you'll see Walsh from getting Maybe you'll see Holmstrom get in for somebody else. Just the yeah. competitors that they are, their final prep for the playoffs. Because you think about it, too, is if they don't play Wednesday and the playoffs start set, that's a lot, a lot of days between games. And I think guys that are feeling really good, especially if you win against the Devils, how good they're feeling right now, the last thing they want, they still have to figure out the power play, too. So this is their final tune-up. It's a good if, point, If they beat yeah. the Devils and, I get, and the power play struggles, you go Wednesday. I mean, you need to figure it out. There's yeah. not many practice days left. Why that, mess with what you have right now, I guess? Well, not only that, but I think that's actually a really good point. The fact that it's almost like, you know, a trial in the wild to, to give, get your power play out there one more time before the, the real games start, if they're fortunate enough to be in by the time Wednesday comes around. Because it's funny, I was sitting here being like, ah, you know what, maybe arrest these guys. Maybe arrest the, the top guns. Anybody who might be dinged up that we don't know about, too, right? And that'll be interesting, too. Maybe there will be a yeah, guy or two sat, and that might reveal that they are dinged up a little bit here. But... You know, to your point, maybe you want those guys out there running some power plays, but it's just that game is going to mean something for the Penguins. It's, gonna, it's, it's absolutely going to mean something for the Penguins. So they're going to be coming out hard. They're going to be playing a tough game. And so it obviously would just be a nightmare to put out, you know, some of your top guns there and, and having somebody on the pens come in and smash somebody into the boards and you lose them for the playoffs. So, I mean, thankfully, that's a decision that Patrick Waugh has to make and not me. But, you know, I was leaning towards rest these guys, but but maybe they, they could use the – well, we know they could use the practice to work on the power play. And you could also middle of the game, see what the how the vibes are, what's going on, how physical it is, and then maybe a couple of shifts a period. You take guys out, sit them. I mean, yeah, that's – Yeah, play the them day, 13 minutes instead of 20, something the, like that. Go with the good old Rempe mindset, five minutes. So just, <laughs> sure. But I, right. I just think with the lack of practice time, with so many still issues with this team, it's her last real tune-up where the games actually matter for a team that – Potentially, you do play in the playoffs. A team that's desperate, which is exactly what playoff hockey is. So it, it truly is the final test for all that stuff. 
Yeah. Uh, the next question is from another than Tom Boyle, who is in the hey, house today. Hey, what's up, T-Boyle? You want to read it, Tom, or should I? I'll read it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take the choice away. <laughs> you know, I, I still like reading questions. You know, uh, it's, it's still my, my segment here. Okay. <laughs> All right. So Tom <laughs> says, segment. do you think the offside play yesterday that took a goal away was correct? Yeah. It was def- I think it was interference, but it was correct. I mean, it was indeed offside. Yeah, it's funny. When it happened live, I didn't think it was that bad. The play on the blue line, the like, guy nudged him. I was like, actually, kind of smart. You know, yeah, like, a let's genius pull, move. Yeah, pull him offside, nullify a potential goal. But then I saw the replay, and I was like, oh, he actually took him out a little oh, bit. Oh, yeah. I was like, that that could have been a penalty. So then, and then I saw PK Subban ranting about it afterwards. He wanted the call on if, the ESPN broadcast, or the ABC broadcast. If you hear PK Subban back anything against just always PK with the way he played, right? Mm. Especially at the end of his career. <laughs> right, when, right. Like, for example, you saw the guy. Gallagher hit where he flips the you know what mm, who played with Gallagher right and you see that where he's saying that's got to be called mm. you know when it's a physical moment in a game and PK is on the side of the person that got hit mm. it's probably right yeah yeah that's that's probably <laughs> true so yeah but look the offside was the right call but you know uh, you look at the play and oh, Pierre Engel <laughs> yeah oh what a shot I mean what a goal but but that- but that goal the other day against the Montreal Canadiens where he peels around and snipes. That and was then beautiful. It, and then yeah. he has that one. That In shouldn't fact, take away from that. For, for a split second, and I know people mix them up all the time, but I legit <laughs> thought it was Brock Nelson. And I was like, oh, damn, that was Pierre Engvall. So that was nice to see. Hopefully we get more of that. But, yeah, it was the right call. Next up from Enzeb, who was actually here today. We met you. Yes. Enzeb, live to in meet the flesh. Enzeb today. Great to John, put a face great to the to name. Meet you, John. Uh, I think we touched about this a bit earlier. Uh, Stefan, you were saying Barzi was talking about how you know, they need to do better with Dobson gone. Uh, so NZEB asks, I understand that Dobson is a big piece of the power play, but they can't have uh, a zero and expect to win. What else can they do to help with that unit? Yeah, I think it's stop being so perimeter and, and don't force things. If there's a shot to be had, Watt told us early on when he was talking about the power play units that top units there to make plays. Second units there to just get pucks on net. Just get pucks on net. Like I talked about before with Ajo's goals last year in the playoffs and just the simple simplicity of when they had success with just getting shots through. That's all they have to do. It doesn't have to be creative. Sure, there are times where you can be creative and have the bang, bang, bang goal. For sure, but right now, just getting the power play going, you need confidence. Just get shots on goal, soft shots. It doesn't have to be a rock from the point. You don't have Dobson. So the rocket is going to probably be on the second unit with Pulak. You know, Brock Nelson's one-timer is not nothing to him. It's just he misses the net a lot on those. So with guys in front, with the way those players, and Palmieri especially, with how hot he's been, just get pucks on net. Sharp angle shots, produce those rebounds. That's the best thing to do right now because overthinking and trying to do too much is not going to bring results. Keeping it simple and getting it that way, that's going to be the best way to get out of this rut. There's yeah. nothing I need to add to that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mike so then job. we'll move on. Yeah, Mike. Excellent, job. excellent job. Stefan, that was, that was like short. That had a lot of context, but you kept it sweet. And not too long. You didn't over-explain, but we, have an, we had a clear-cut answer there. Thanks, that was Dad. crazy. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next up from DTMR. Why no shots from the point on the power play? Pollock bombs needed. Pollock bombs Pollock are not bombs. Beams. Yeah. <laughs> they're not. Pollock, Pollock bombs don't go where they need to go. That's the problem. They, uh, they're, they're inaccurate. <laughs> so I talked to him. Sometimes I, they hit, though. And when they do, it is nice. So I talked to Pollock a month or two ago. I did a story for it as well of, of just what happened to the accuracy because he was. <laughs> really? <laughs> it was pretty blunt. And I, I just said, you know, obviously he's had tr- trouble with the accuracy. Just what's gone into it? And he said, you know what? He has struggled mightily with finding the right stick. He said that yeah, said he that. said that every year that they change the flex. He's had a really. He said he's using a, a much older stick now, a much older. Um, what's it called? The, the flex things like that than he's used in the past. Mm-hmm. He just has a hard hard time, and I guess it's interesting if you're a baseball fan as well with this new pitch clock they have. It takes time to get used to changes, and I think for Pulak, finding the stick's important. Now, I think a lot of it has to do with the mindset. Obviously, he has the talent. He's hit the net before. But he said right now he's happy, and you've noticed it. Even since Waz here, since he's come back from his injury, he's been more accurate. The wrist shots are more accurate. The slap shots are, are more accurate. So I think he's, he's settling into a groove. And I, I think on the power play, for sure, when he has the bomb to shoot it, whether it's going to go top shelf, uh, short side, or produce a rebound, that's key. But like I said, getting the simple shots on the point, that's what's going to be traffic in front of goals, make life as hard as possible. Because, sure, those shots are great, but if – you're, you know, I talked to Parise about it last year. I said, when you see Pulak winding up, he goes, I'm getting out of the way because that's not a shot I'm trying to screen the goalie on. That's me trying to open up for a rebound. So I, I think Pulak's shot is great when he could use it to do that. But I think the focus has to be the softer shots. It's more accurate when you're doing the softer stuff. Well, that's it right there. And that's been the talk is that the, the slap shot is kind of 
becoming a, th- a thing of old, right? I mean, Unless you have s- an empty net in your uh, the outer center. <laughs> right. Yes. Not to say that nobody's taking slap shots anymore, but you're not seeing it as frequently. And, and to your point, it, I'd much rather see a defenseman take a more accurate wrist shot that just has a better chance of making its way to the net or, or even ticking off somebody on yeah. the way in. And, and that's all you kind of need. But, but, but I think to the main point, to the question – is that we just need to see more pucks coming from the yep. point in any shape or form. That's that's the problem is I think they're just getting too picky. And it might have even been you on the show. There was somebody who pointed out the fact that, that Dobson – Rarely take shots from the point. He's always looking past, and that there was like a there was a breakdown. It might have yes. been on Twitter, wherever it yeah. was, but there was a breakdown of of how the frequency of Dobson shots, and, and obviously he's been on the power play all season, and the number was just so low by comparison to to a lot of other guys out there. So it's just a situation where they seem to lean he- more much more heavily on getting the puck down low and trying for shots down there, but but. Throw some in from the point. I mean, you got the you got the extra bodies down low. Let the puck drop. Let the puck bounce off of somebody and just clean up the garbage. Put it in the net. And my point of view just as a goalie is if you're see a team setting up for the one-timer, first off, you go into the game with film knowing what the game plan is. And But I, I just think if you see it at the point, you know that those shots aren't going to come, you're already anticipating the pass to either face off dot for the one-timer. You're getting set. But if there's traffic in front and the puck goes to the point and you're fighting and he shoots it back to the way or just a soft shot, much harder to track. When you know it's coming and it's going to come fast, you're like, okay, he's probably going glove side if it's going to the top of the right, or as a goalie, the left circle. He's probably not going against the green. Same way, vice versa. I can get set, which is why goalies like Varlamov right now, Sorokin when he's on his game is, they get over so fast. The goalies understand, they read it. But point shots, like you said, you're not just fighting to find where the shot's coming from or where it's going, but now you're trying to pick it up through sticks and then the rebounds, when you can't pick it up and you're picking it up last second, very hard to control the rebound. Whereas if it's a hard shot, blocker to the corner catching it those low wrist shots unless you catch it in the chest they're probably going right back out to the slot there you go all right next up from luigi mani i believe it's mani i want to say it's italian <laughs> Fair I, enough. it's not main mani you know luigi luigi hands is what that was sure mean. there you go so <laughs> luigi hands <laughs> go to sandwich chips drink combo from blue line for me it's the zamboni add hot sauce and, and onions with kettle chips any kind and a diet coke blue line is the best Wow. Anybody want to take well, that one? Z- Zamboni is I, uh, my favorite. Zamboni's your favorite? The Zamboni is incredible. My dad and I both get it every time. My girlfriend today is getting the... Is it up there? The back check, I think? It's up there. Uh, I can't okay. see it. It's just okay. Oh, anyway, she, she told me I had to get her a sandwich. <laughs> Because this wow. is the sandwich. Don't come home here, without a sandwich. No, these sandwiches here are absolutely incredible. We know this. Yeah. This is true. <laughs> Unreal. I'm a big Jimmy B guy. Roast beef, good stuff. Jimmy B is what I go with. I would, I would go bacon, egg, and cheese most times. I got one today. But if I had to choose a specialty sandwich, sure. the blue liner. Okay. I'm, a, I'm a sucker for a chicken cutlet ah. and Russian dressing, bacon. Okay. I mean, how could you not? She's, no, she's no. getting the butterfly, by the way. The butterfly. The butterfly. Yeah. Okay. The butterfly. Okay. It even sounds nice. Yeah, it's yeah. great. Okay. All right. Very good. Hey, Donnie, you're hanging out here. You got a favorite sandwich to make here, buddy? He the likes hockey the hockey night in New, New York. York. Oh, what a great why, answer. Why didn't I think of that? When was the last time you had one? With the avocado. With the avocado. Well, he remembers the ingredients. That's good. That's good. All right. In honor of Christian. Have you had one in 2024? <laughs> All right. That's fine. We'll, we'll work on that. We'll, we'll talk behind the scenes. We'll great cut, question. We'll cut that. <laughs> uh, CGS878 wants to know if we're ever going to update the Blue Line commercial. He said it's old. It's a fair Are we going to do a new one? We're getting the thumbs up from Donnie. I think I think we all need to be in the we, next one. We've had well, we'll see. Well, we'll oh, see. come on. I'll do it. <laughs> you don't even have to pay let's, me for it. Let's up your brakes. I'll buddy. do a free feature. Well, you know what? There has been some talk behind the scenes. There's been some chatter. We haven't gotten too far along, but but yes, we know it. It, it, it is a bit aged. I mean, it's a classic. Let's be honest. It's a. I know. I mean, it's, it's a, a happy great Gilmore commercial, skit. and and Donnie put his heart and soul into it. The acting chops were just <laughs> off the charts. <laughs> Can't can't stand those lightning, <laughs> but you uh, really can't though. But yeah, I, I think I think we'll we'll get an update on it pretty soon. I like to, we'll, <laughs> we'll see what happens. We'll update it when he eats a hockey night in New York City. There we go. Donnie there we go. We we got a we got a long summer to think about that. So maybe maybe or we'll short some, summer. Hey, come on, let's yeah or short. No, yeah, oh, I see no, what don't you're saying. Me. Don't attack me. I was <laughs> I was ready. I was, I was ready. <laughs> I meant you know if the honor's going to run it, it's a shorter summer. Okay, I like that. Ooh, that I thought I was going to get punched. All right, good stuff. Next up from aisle 72. Am I the only one that thinks that Trocek took a bit of a dive on Dobson to draw a penalty? Hmm. 
I, I think I mean, he went in a little easy. He did. I mean, anybody would do this in his circumstances. Yeah, but when he got up, he did look right at the ref. He was like, huh, did you see that? You know? Again, I think he had the right to. I think it's yeah, boarding a minimum it a two minute, two minute penalty. But I think Trotrick did get the last laugh, obviously winning it in the shootout. Uh, That's yesterday. true. But yeah, I thought it was a bit of a dive, I think. But you see it called all the time. So yeah, I, I, I don't. I definitely think Dobson deserved the call there. Yep. I'm not upset that he didn't get one. But I think I think he had uh, Trocheck had an argument to be made, and, and you talk about thinking about somebody who's going to hit someone. Looked like Trocheck was going to hit the ref after that. I mean, he went right at him. He was he was animated to say the least. Good on Dobson, yeah. though. By the way, moving on is you need to see Dobson physical, and in a game like that, to lay that hit there, it's like a goalie where if you don't go after the person in front of your crease, you're going to keep going back there True. and bullying you. True. So I thought even if Dobson got called on that, that's a statement hit right there. Sure. Sure. Next up for Mr. Trotty in nineteen, who's been concerned about my black hat. But, uh, you know, I, I explained that away. Oh, but okay. It, it'll come back. Fair know? enough. He, he loves my black hat. Oh, for, the Black Islander uh, hat. He loves yes, the black hat. Got it. Last okay. legs. I was explaining. Well, anyway, he <laughs> asks, when was the last time the Islanders had a good pl- power play? The Dynasty days or 1993 with Turgeon and Thomas? Do you young whippersnappers remember? I mean, I, I mean a, a consistent, like, top of the league power play? I, I Nothing comes to mind. For me, I mean, there there were there were spots where they were top fifteen, top ten here and there, here and there. But like, the last time the Islanders had like a consistently reliable power play, it probably goes back to one of those one of those eras that were just mentioned here. Uh, you know, it's just been something that they've been struggling with. Um, you know, it was better earlier this year. We thought that it was it was a problem solved, and and I made a comment on Twitter about it too. That that since Wa took over, the power play has taken a dive. Now, is that because Wa has taken over? Is that a direct result of of what he is telling these guys to do out there? It could be, but for whatever reason, whether it's a coincidence or not, the power play has been very <laughs> very poor since that time came around when, when Patrick Watt took over. So I don't know if he went to Johnny Mack and said, do this, do this, do this, and then it's gone south, or if, or if it's a coincidence or what. I mean, because like, like we've talked about this too, even going into this season where you thought the PK was going to be great yep. and the power play was going to be str- struggling, right? And then it was the complete opposite. And now we're in a place where the penalty kill has gotten a little bit better, but the power play has now hit the tank. And you just, it's just tough to figure out. Yeah, I definitely wasn't alive when it was a good unit. No, you weren't, no, uh, no. I think teams yeah. may have been black and white. I'm really not sure. <laughs> um, it's, I, yeah. think, I think all of life was black and white back in the day. I think that was just what it was picking up. I don't think we had color None of until us would know. 1960 yeah, know. in the world. I don't think <laughs> Maybe. The sun was different back then. Okay. The yeah. sun was different? Yeah. It, it's what brings us, you know, our rainbows, our light, our, uh, our spectrum here, <laughs> wow. you know? <laughs> I, need to, I need to go home. <laughs> yeah, Ed is, Ed is on a tear today. Ed is yeah. happy to be here. <laughs> yeah, we're having a good day. So, uh, what do we got next here? If well, we, we do uh, have something next, we, we have plenty. We have uh, we have repeat mm. offenders in the chat. <laughs> repeat uh, offenders. Yeah. <laughs> do we have any quality yeah. questions? Yeah. Left? Well, I'll, 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 I was going to do another one from Tom Boyle, these. who's here. He asks, "Is okay. Hughes going to be ready for camp?" Uh, I believe Jack Hughes will be ready for camp. Um, is that what you just asked? Yeah. yeah, I think he will be ready for camp. They probably should have shut him down a lot earlier to make it a guarantee. Mm. I think he will be, though, but I'm not a doctor. I have no idea. Okay. All right. What else you got? We have another one from NZ. Who gets, uh, who gets the remaining starts and the bulk of the playoff work? Varley has made a case to be the man. It is. There's no look ahead to the bulk. It is going to be a game-by-game thing. If yeah. Varley plays well against the Devils and the game doesn't matter against Pittsburgh, Sorokin goes in, but I think it's Varlamov's crease until he gives Wa a reason to switch. That being said, if the first game of the playoffs, Ronaldo's not great and he, he struggles, he'll go to probably to Sorokin. But there's no way to look ahead at, at game plan that. Yeah, I think we have to see what happens tomorrow and Wednesday before a, a final decision is made. But I think, as you said earlier, if the playoffs started tomorrow and the Islanders are there, I think Varlamov gets game one. I think, you know, you can look at it that way. Yeah. Another one from Isle72. Has the coaching staff have any ideas why the PK is so horrible? <laughs> I tend to think they don't have the type of players to get the job done. So you say that, but then there's times where it looks really, really good, and it's mm. about finding consistency, right? Uh, we don't obviously get to talk to the, the coaches. That's just a rule. You can't talk to them. But they have two defensive coaches now here, with Benoit coming in, with Wa brought in, and, and Huda being here. So not that I say it's up to the coaches, but they've definitely structurally changed a few things. But it comes down to just bearing down. We've seen so many times where that one clear could have happened, and, for example, Pajot deking trying to get the puck out and, or making a quick pass. Just... If they keep it simple, the PK will be just fine. We're seeing them play a lot better at the six-on-five situation against. 
So I just think it's players making the plays. I think the players are here to be successful. I think last year they started like the first eight games. They were, their pa- penalty kill was perfect. So mm. I think the players have it in themselves. It's just That's about right. bearing down. Ed, if you have one more good one. We do. Okay. <sighs> and Zeb, this is a hard question for me to ask. Has Sorokin lived up to the hype? He has had moments, but has issues. Would we have uh, been better served staying with Varley and using the money wow. in other places? Didn't well, see that one coming. Well, the money like, money has not kicked in yet. So we can't talk about money yet because the contract kicks in next year, correct? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So has he lived up? Every contract is when the end of the contract's done. If the Islanders win a cup, that's all that matters, right? You could A player could be f- bad for the first four years of their deal, but if the fifth year... He wins MVP and they win the Stanley Cup. That's fine. I think he has to be better. He definitely can't be the way he's been this year going forward if they're paying him this kind of money to be that number one guy. I do think he'll bounce back. I don't think it was, let's keep Varlamov. Again, Varlamov is a guy that's been a great backup, could be just stutter on 10 teams, but can he play a full 60-something games every year? No, I don't think it was a mistake to sign Sorokin. and I think you had to. Maybe um, the AAV is something that he had to prove more of to get at that high, but this is the day in the NHL where... Goalies that are that good, when they show to be that good, get that money. Now it's up to Sorokin to be better, but I don't think it was a situation where they could have saved money. The Islanders are built from the goaltending on up. They need a guy like Sorokin here. I think the answer is yes, he has lived up to the hype. I think everybody's just disappointed with the season that he's had. Mm -hmm. And I have faith that this is a guy who's going to bounce back. I don't think that this year's Ilya Sorokin is going to be the Ilya Sorokin we get for the duration of that contract. I think he just has such a large body of work, and I know some of this goes outside of the NHL, but he's been a great success everywhere he's been. He was obviously amazing last year. He was, you know, a lot of people were picking him to be the Vezina winner this year, and I think this is more a bump in the road than anything else. And, and what we've learned, we, we've made references to other goaltenders as well, whether it's Bobrovsky or who, whomever, where, you know, you're not always going to get an A season out of your top goal. Even look at Shesterkin. Yeah. I remember Ranger fans crying about Shesterkin not too long ago in, in recent years, saying that he may not be the guy and he's not living up to the hype. And, and now, look, he's bounced back. He's playing great again. So I don't, I, don't think, I don't think we have a lot to worry about with Sorokin. It's unfortunate that he's not having the year that you know everybody expected, but he still has time to change that narrative, too. We can get into the playoffs, and he can be the guy that everybody's waiting for, and, and maybe a little late, but would be the perfect time for me. Whoever's in goal needs more help from the team in front of them. That fact. That being, yeah. whatever Sorokin did last year, which was unreal and un unhum- I mean, that was not human, what he did last <laughs> year. He's been a little more human this year, but if the honors are going to win consistency going forward under Wa, the defense has to be much better in front of whoever is in between the pipes. I think that's a, a great way to end it. So thank you to everybody for tuning in live, for helping us out here in Questions Bruin. Ed, cue that music. So, folks, I want to thank Donald Rosner and Blue Line Deli and Bagels for having us here at this wonderful spot. The food is fantastic. The people are even better. If you haven't been here yet, definitely come on down. Check them out. Try out the menu. It is absolutely wonderful, and it's a pleasure to be here. It was a pleasure to help Donnie out raise some money for the Chloe Bell Foundation earlier today. And, of course, a big thanks to Blue Line Deli and and Bagels for presenting our show located here at 719 West Jericho Turnpike in Huntington and 217 Carlson Avenue in East Islip. Check out the menu or order online at bluelinedeli.com. Also, a huge thanks to Main Street Board Game Cafe located at 307 Main Street in Huntington Village. Find out how to unplug your game at mainstboardgamecafe.com. And also a huge thanks to Razor and Kniff Attorneys at Law. Nobody likes going to court, but if you have to, call 516-742-7600 for a free consultation. Also, a huge thanks Thanks to Devils legend Ken Danico for joining us here today. Talking about the Devils, talking Isles, talking playoff race, outstanding stuff from Ken. And, of course, a big thanks for you guys for tuning in here at twitch.tv slash Hockey9NY and your favorite streaming providers. Stefan Rosner, where can everybody find you on the Internet and stuff? Yeah, you can find me at Stefan underscore Rosner, S-T-E-F-E-N-R-O-S-N-E-R, on Twitter, Hockey News, Islanders, Rangers, and NHL.com. You can follow myself, Shawnee Hockey, on Twitter. You can follow the show at Hockey Night NY on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, and everywhere else. And folks, if you dig what you're doing, what we're doing here at Hockey Night New York, please rate, review, subscribe, like, all that stuff. Tell your friends, tell your acquaintances, and spread the word of Hockey Night in New York. And with that, we will be back next week hopefully talking New York Islanders playoffs big game tomorrow big game Wednesday thanks to everybody for tuning in so for Stefan Rosner 
for Jake the Snake, for Edzo over here. Thanks to T. Boyle for hanging out with us live. And again, thank you to Donald Rosner and the great Blue Line and Delhi staff for having us here, host us here. We had a wonderful time. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.